welcome to series eight of the Lawyers Coach podcast. I'm Claire Rayson and I am here with co-host Ollie Hansard. Hi Ollie. Hi Claire, how are you? I'm good, thank you. And it's been a little while since we finished up series seven. So what have you been doing in the intervening period? All sorts of great coaching, um, particularly doing a whole load of promotion work in uh, a range of law firms, which has been amazing fun. How about you, Claire? What have you been up to? Um, I've been, again, doing lots of coaching, particularly seeing lots of firms thinking about how they can promote more women up into partnerships. I've been doing lots of firms thinking about that. Um, and also lots of work around soft skills, which I think is something that we're going to be um, thinking about with some of our guests over this series. Oh, it's our favourite topic, Claire, definitely. It is. Soft skills or success skills, we will find out um, as we move <laughs> through the episodes. Brilliant. So the first episode, um, who have you been speaking to? So I've been speaking to Lee Curtis, who's Managing Director of Liner Consulting. And he focuses on business development skills for lawyers. And it's a fantastic uh, conversation as he talks about soft skills being the key thing to help lawyers stand out in today's market. It's a, it's a currency of difference, if you like. Wonderful. Well, let's press play and let's hear what Lee had to say. Lee, welcome to the Lawyers Coach podcast. Thanks a lot, Ollie. Nice to be here. We always like to start with a little bit of background with our guests. So how did you end up where you are now and deep into the legal industry? Yeah, I'm, I mean, interesting one. Dumb luck would be the answer, really, Ollie, to be <laughs> honest. Um, so, uh, well, it's, it's a lifetime ago now, but about 20 years ago, um, I was on, uh, for those that are old enough to remember it, the milk round, trying to find a job after university. And um, this company uh, arose out of a website called, uh, some might know it, it's called Allen and Overy. They had a graduate scheme. Uh, so I applied to that uh, after having been knocked back from a bunch of other uh, corporates. And the rest really is history. So you joined a and as, as a non-lawyer on their grad scheme? Yeah, I mean, essentially, there's a, there a chap there by the name of Barry Jackson. And what he had done was taken the... I suppose, the legal trainee framework so that um, each uh, business development kind of entry level uh, apprentice like myself went through four six month rotations for a different department. Um, and at the time, I think that was the Barry was the only guy doing it in the industry. Um, but the great thing was it gave us a massive amount of exposure to different parts of the law firm so you were um at any one time working on transactional sides of the business and then contentious sides of the business so you really got a full spectrum of um the kind of activities and initiatives that um were being used at the time and 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 then you went from from a and o and 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 then that was pretty much a a career focused in on the legal industry is that fair to say yeah it was so i had a uh, i had a three-year blip if you will which was great um so i left a and o um and actually went to british telecom for three okay. years so um i um another kind of answered an, an advert but i i became a commercial project manager there so I did my project management qualifications and ended up working on big systems implementation projects and bids um but then uh i suppose the law came back calling um and at that point in kind of early 2008 um i'd really got bored of going to work in the dark and coming home in the dark in london uh so i booked a one way ticket to sydney um and went oh, out amazing. there yeah amazing. went out there for 6 years um and fell back into law firm bd and how would you say, um, you know, lawyers fair when it comes comes to BD? You know, you're being you're being that specialist. Um, is it is it? Are you able to have kind of assumption? You know, draws assumptions about lawyers generally and their ability with BD. Yeah, I mean, look, it's, a, it's an interesting question and one that I, I wrestle with day to day in the new company and have done for for years. I mean, um. This is broad brush, but my experience is, well, I call it the 20-60-20 rule, right? 20% of lawyers get it. 
they understand business development, they understand sales and why it's important in an increasingly saturated competitive environment. Um, and they don't need much pushing to do the right thing day after day. Um, 60% of most law firms, they want to get it, but they need a bit of help. Um, that it's not their core skill set. Um, I'm not, I haven't met many lawyers who jump up and down with glee when you talk to them about sales. Um, really, um, there's not many lawyers that went to law school and wanted to go to law school so they could, uh, you know, go out and, and show their wares day after day and get rejected on a regular basis. Um, but those 60%, they get it, they understand it, they need a bit of help. And then there's the 20% at the end. And frankly speaking, they're just not, you know, like like large swathes of the population. They're not they're not born to do business development. Their skill sets lie elsewhere. And um, it's very, very difficult to convert those 20%. So that's that's how I'd sum up lawyers and BD and sales. And that's a great starting point. So is is your job to to move the 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 twenty percent that don't want to do it at all into the sixty percent bracket and and and, and and grow it or do you think right now i'm just going to focus on the 60 that need the extra help and maybe enhance that 20 percent a little bit more how, how do you think about how you apply uh, yourself to a firm yeah ollie definitely the latter for me that what you've just said so just to make that perfectly clear that bottom 20 percent, i think you're on a hide into nothing i think you can spend a disproportionate amount of your time trying to convert those people now okay. there are exceptions to the rule because there will be very, very important and powerful partners and associates within that bottom bracket that you need to get on board. Um, that said, exactly as you've just suggested, you know, my my goal and my aim is to convert many, many of those 60% into that top bracket so that they and enable them with the skills and the capabilities more naturally so they can go out and win more business. So, so if, if I, I know you've seen that the survey that we did, the lawyers coach survey that we did, we did in the autumn, and and one of the outcomes of that was that fifty eight percent of those that that responded said soft skills um, was the most important thing that needed a, a, attention. Is that consistent with your your um, your experience? If you think as BD is one of those key soft skills. Definitely. Definitely. I mean, if it, you know, I'm very biased, but I'd, I'd say that was a lo <laughs> I'd say that was a low percentage. Right. OK. Um, and, and the reason I say that is is quite simple. So if, if I look at the um, the legal landscape, be it domestically in the UK or internationally, um, you know, there's a few things that are clear to me. One is that the competitive landscape is and continues to be very competitive. There's a lot of law firms out there that can do what clients are asking them to do. And any and any lawyer worth their salt um, will not stand behind the fact that they are now, you know, they they are unique and, and what they do is absolutely unique. So what you've got is you've got a homogeneous set of products and services that law firms deliver at a certain level. And, you know, we've been saying it in the BD community for years, but just giving the legal advice is no longer enough. So if if that is the case and you accept that proposition, what well, else? But do they accept that proposition? Sorry to interrupt, uh, but, no, oh, but well, is that generally accepted? Um, it's accepted more than it was five years ago and more than it was okay. 10 years ago. But you make a very good point. There are still some dare I say, in that bottom 20% bracket that I spoke about earlier, that are absolutely convinced that the legal advice that they provide on a day-to-day -day basis is absolutely unique within the industry. Um, I don't buy that, except in some very, very rare niche cases. But let's talk about the population as a whole. I just don't buy that. So if, if that proposition is uh, accepted, um, what else do you have to deal deal on you know what other characteristics and behaviors are going to stand you out against the competition and for me it's absolutely in that softer skills bracket so you know your ability to um actively listen to your client and understand 
where the advice you provide sits within a wider bi business context. Um, your ability to network both internally within your firm so that you win more mandates from an internal perspective, but also externally out there in the market. If you can become one of those dot connectors and connect clients to other clients for ancillary and adjacent services, then you're going to be successful. Um, there are many more I could go into, but I think for me, the currency of differentiation is at that now, that softer skills level. Everyone expects a certain level of legal advice and service, but what you are differentiating yourself is on essentially customer service. Um, and that manifests itself when you're buying and selling people in the ways in which those people are interacting with you. So can I just explore that phrase, um, yeah. a dot, dot connector, because I think that's a really interesting one. And and I, and I know there are some lawyers who are really nervous about introducing, you know, a, an accountant or, a, you know, a, a potential collaborator or, 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 or deal uh, counterpart because they're worried about the liability that, that in, in, in the implied liability having made that connection might might bring. What, what do you say to that? What do you say to that reticence to, to, to connect those dots? I completely understand it. Um, but, you know, for me, it, it comes down to um, one word, essentially, and that, that is trust. So, you know, anyone that's done any thinking or reading uh, by David Meister about the trust equation, um, you know, you will know that over time, and it does take time, you know, this is an instant gratification, but over time, you establish rapport and you establish relationships, not only with your clients, but with people that you work with, et cetera, et cetera. And at those points, when you're making those introductions, you have to be confident and you have to trust in the ability of your colleagues and your counterparts to perform to the, to the levels of quality and expectation that you've become used to and that clients expect. And that is, that is very challenging, um, particularly in my experience um, for lawyers, um, particularly for, and the reason I say that is um, if I was going to characterize a lawyer, a typical lawyer, one of the challenges they have is that largely speaking, they need to understand 100% of the topic they're talking about at all times. Now that is simply not possible when you're looking at, you know, adjacent services and things like that you can't be an expert in everything and so there is to a certain extent a leap of faith and that is challenging in my experience for the lawyer population but there's also a lens which is which is a lawyer's and i and i say this having been a general counsel so on, yeah. on the inside of a business as opposed to in 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 a law firm but there's also a sense which is a, a lawyer is just a business person who happens to have a particular speciality and if and if that frame of mind i think is one that might be helpful for, for a lawyer as they connect those dots um think about different ways of, of of building a business building a business case reaching out to clients so so it, what do you think to that kind of mindset i i'd fully endorse that you know my my experience suggests that you've you've identified probably the top 20% of what we were talking about earlier. So, I mean, again, I'll turn the question back on yourself as a general counsel, right? I, I suspect, you know, throughout your career in your experience, the lawyers that you like to deal with most didn't just think about, you know, the IP rights associated with position X. They were thinking much more broadly than that. And they were you know, introducing their colleagues or introducing, you know, new emerging risks that were a bit uncomfortable for them, a bit outside of their own skill set. But yet they were grounding all of their advice to you as a GC in that business context. I, I suggest that you might have had other law firms and lawyers where um, the, the lawyer, the partner, the MA in question had complete blinkers on and did an absolutely fantastic job in that very niche narrow band of advice that you asked them for and that was great but unfortunately 
the world doesn't work like that. <laughs> and, and you use the word context, right? Context is, is everything. The advice needs to be great, but the context needs to be understood and responded to. So yeah, yeah. I, I think it is really well said. So, so let me ask you this or paint this picture. I, I'm a, I'm a, you know, an associate, a senior associate, I'm thinking about my, or a mid-level associate, I'm thinking about partnership is for me. Um, that's that's the route I want to go. Um, but I know I need to build a practice to achieve that. What would your, you know, top tips be in terms of, you know, what should I do starting now? What are, what are the key things I should do as a, as a professional to, to build that practice? Yeah, good question. Um, I think there are probably two or three things you should start doing right now. Um, the first one I've mentioned earlier, I think it is incredibly important, is is network. Um, and if I if I start with network, I mean that in two contexts. Um, if you have aspirations to partnership, you are going to need support internally to get there. And I don't just mean your sponsoring partner. The more people that sing internally about how great you are and how helpful you are is really going to stand you in good stead when you go in front of the you know partnership committee or or the equivalent so building out your internal network um is incredibly useful at the same time though equally as important is letting the world know that you're around and you're there now you can do that in a in a wide variety of contexts dependent on um your own persona your own characteristics so for you know not every lawyer likes standing up and presenting or going to networking events. You know, quite quite a few lawyers um, are more um, cerebral and like writing articles and things like that. There is There are opportunities for every type of character to build their network out um, amongst their client base and wider. And there are channels to do that that we didn't have 10 years ago, you know, the likes of LinkedIn and and similar. So there's an ability to do that. The second thing that I'd say is that, um, and and it was termed to me by an ex-chairman of a, uh, a, a UK top 200 firm, is to find your splendid splinter. So what... That's what, brilliant. What That's do we a great mean? phrase. Yeah, what do we mean by that? That's that's really try and become an expert in something, right? However niche it is, whether it's a certain certain impact on a certain regulation that's buried way down in a statute book, if you become the firm expert or the world expert in that in your chosen industry, um, people will come knocking because they'll ask questions about it. So. Um, making sure that you have uh, a USP, to put it in my terms, a unique selling point um, from a, you know, from a technical perspective is is also um, useful. Um, they'd be my kind of two top tips for someone that's heading towards or trying to head towards partnership. Brilliant. That's really helpful. Thank you. And then looking at it from the other way around, I'm a senior partner in you know, a decent, a decent sized law firm, but I know that BD isn't what it should be. How should I set, well, what, what changes could I make? How should I set up a marketing function? You know, what, what should I do as, as the leader of an organization? Now that is a great question. Um, and something I'd love to talk to many, many managing and senior partners about. I think the first thing, the first thing to say is that, um, like it or not, uh, the legal industry has changed and is changing under our feet. Um, and the way in which um, we go to market as an industry has changed. And so for senior and managing partners that may well be heading more towards the twilight of their careers rather than the nursery side, it's to take advice. It's to get soundings from their line partners that are working day in, day out on new client engagements and ways of working. It's to really consult with 
the nuts and bolts of the business as to what's working and what isn't working. Um, you know, if I if I turn my attention more to where I've played, uh, you know, for the past two decades in the marketing and business development teams, you know, for C for CMOs, chief marketing officers, and heads of business development out there, um, you know, I think in the past five years they've suffered very much in a similar way to the um, the GCs of corporates and in-house council, right? Which is, you know, people have woken up to the fact that you're a cost centre. Um, and so how do, you, how do you rebalance that equation so that you're actually adding value back into the business? Um, you know, and one of the things I'm... Demonstrably. You know, just, because yeah. that, I wouldn't want to imply that they haven't been adding value, but it's demonstrating that value tangibly. Yeah, yeah, and Ollie, you're absolutely right because the one of the one of the biggest challenges that BD has is that tangible demonstration measurement of um, whether it's an increase in reputation, an increase in visibility, or things like that. Um, and so, you know, CMOs really need to get very smart about measurement and data associated with value that's being delivered back. And one of the one of the things I'm really proud of of the time at, at Simmons, which was my last big law firm, was that we sought to reshape the BD function so that it was much more client facing. And in certain aspects, mine included being sales, it was revenue generating. And so it was very, very easy to demonstrate the value back to the firm because we were actually adding to the bottom line. That's great, and 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 you talk about the change in the in the um, in the industry and 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 different sources to market. Let me frame the question like this: it, it, Do you think that AI will ever replace you know those soft skills that 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 we talked about earlier? Is is, is AI going to be a panacea for um, for for solving a, a range of BD problems? Um, I, is it is it going to be an answer to solving BD problems? Absolutely, 100%. Um, is it going to replace the BD function? And I'll be a slightly controversial here. You'd need, I'd need to give you a timeline. So, you know, for the for the BD and marketing colleagues out there at the moment, you've got a time, you've got a time horizon and a window, right, to embrace artificial intelligence and and particularly generative artificial intelligence. Um, you know, look, it's it it is a. a in in similar ways, it is both a fascinating and a frankly quite scary new technological development, right? The pace of change and the pace of adoption is startling. And if I if I break down for you just one example in relation to you know business development and marketing that I've been looking at a lot recently, it's it's the ability to create very, very comprehensive and engaging campaigns with relatively small amounts of effort if you are doing the right thing. Um, that comes, though, with a massive caveat, and that is, and I was talking about this on LinkedIn this morning, I think people who are not across the capabilities of Gen AI as much as they should be at the moment are seeing it as a replacement, a like for like replacement of humans. I don't see that's the case. You know, my my greatest, my best analogy that I've been thinking about is that for those that like the Alien films, you know, at the end of Alien, um, the android bishop got into an exoskeleton, right? AI is like the exoskeleton. It gives you superhuman powers but it still needs you to drive it right it's nothing without you the human i think that'll continue for a while to come but um i'm very excited about the opportunities and therefore lawyers will still need to develop their practice will still need to develop that trust with their clients um and will still need to to um de keep developing these soft skills a ai isn't going to be um be replacing any of that I, I i hear you saying yeah i mean, I mean look um you know if, if we flick to lawyers for a second you know look at look at the capabilities ai has to make every every junior 
level associate a superhuman, right? So you're putting you're putting in the hands of those junior associates, if used correctly, um, abilities to um, summarize and understand huge volumes of information in record quick times. Uh, you've got the ability to access, you know, the entirety of PLC or Thomson Reuters and assess all of that case law in record time. Um, but again, it comes with a massive health warning, right? It is a tool and every tool needs someone to use it. So I think in the next probably two to five years, the winners are going to be the people that um, enable the use of AI um, best. Brilliant. Really helpful, really helpful guidance. Look, we're, we're, we're coming to the end, but let, let me ask you one one last question, which um, I don't know, might be a big question, but um, we, we, we had a series, two or three series back about success and and what lawyers, you know, define success both for themselves, their business, be that, you know, personally or for the firm or, or, or whatever that might be. For you, when you interact with 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 clients, with lawyers, as you grow your business or personally, how do you define success how do i define it for myself or how do i define it for them or both i, I would love both i think i think yeah. i'd be fascinated to, to hear both um look i i, I mean I'm, I'm conscious of who i'm speaking to ollie but look lawyers are a unique breed in a very positive way um but um i think i think this stands for any client engagement I have really, whether it's a lawyer, it's an accountant, or it's a, it's a corporate team. Um, you know, I am seeking to make them look good. That's my entire job, right? If I can make the individual or the team look good in front of their bosses, then we all go home happy. Um, and the reason for that is, is clear. Everyone is on some sort of progression everyone likes to be um admired and recognized for the work they do it's an it's a natural human trait so anything that i can do to support individuals teams and firms to look better and you know in my world generate more revenue is a good thing um similarly i mean for me personally it's it's much the same you know if i can leave an engagement and ask for feedback and the feedback is positive, then I'm happy, you know, because we've already done the work around, well, you know, what's the cost of that? What's the value of that? That's, that's kind of the mechanics. Um, but what I ask for at the end of every engagement is honest and open feedback as to, you know, what we got right and what we can improve on. And, um, you know, if during that feedback process, someone says something nice, uh, I grow a couple of inches. <laughs> Amazing. Well, let me give you some feedback. You've been a fantastic guest. It's been really great <laughs> speaking to you. And what I would what I would say, Lee, is I think you've found your splendid splinter when it comes to um helping helping lawyers grow their 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 um their softer skills and, and improving their BD. So look, thanks ever so much for being on the Lawyers Coach Podcast. Thank you very much for the invite. So that was Ollie uh, speaking to Lee. Didn't disappoint. I've got a number of things that I want to jump in and talk about. But but Ollie, what stood out for you from that conversation? I think two things really, Claire. The, the first one was this notion that not every lawyer is going to succeed and be the best business developer. And I liked his 20%, 60%, 20% approach to move the, the middle 60% of, if you like, you know, um, unwilling business developers up into the more willing top 20% category. I thought that was just a really pragmatic approach. Yeah, and it's, what kind of struck me um, with that is um, it is very similar to something I heard recently about diversity and this notion that there is always a coachable middle. So you always have, um, with, with most projects where you're trying to move people, you will have people in the middle who, you know, are the ones that, you know, could be convinced either way, but they're the ones that you perhaps need to focus on. You will always have a percentage that just get it. Um, and you'll always have a percentage that really are going to be difficult to shift. 
Um, but it's this idea of this coachable middle that kind of, you know, as I said, is something that I've kind of been playing with in my mind for a while now. And uh, we started off at the beginning. Are they soft skills or are they success skills? And it was interesting to hear Lee talking about them. What was your take? Well, the other one, I, I really love this phrase he used um, when he said, every lawyer, and I suppose it goes for everyone really, should find what he described as your splendid splinter. In other words, identify that area that you have, which everybody has, of uniqueness, really become an expert in it. And then that's your go-to, um, go-to-market um, USP, unique selling point, and really, really work on that and use that as your as your strongest muscle, if you like. People, sometimes we forget what makes us different and what makes us special. And I think when we try and be like somebody else or we try and do things like the person down the corridor, we're kind of bound to fail before we even start. So I think recognising that we each come with our own strengths, whatever they are, and and trying to understand what our strengths are and, and focusing on those, I think, has to be the way to do business development for me. Absolutely. So thank you so much, Ollie. That was a great conversation with Lee. So in the next episode, I have a conversation with Nikki Owen, who is Head of Professional Practices at Crow. And amongst other things, she reveals an interesting start into her tax career. I worked for the MOD and I had to sign the Official Secrets Act. Um, and I used to have to go up to a place in West Supermare. And in the at low tide, we would lay explosives on the sand. And at high tide, effectively, we would blow them up. So that was Nikki, who I will be speaking to in the next episode of Lawyer's Coach. Thanks, Ollie, and thanks for listening. Lawyers Coach is brought to you by Client Talk and Hansard Coaching. If you're a lawyer and would like to take part in Lawyers Coach, please visit our website, lawyercoach.co.uk, for further details. And you can also join the conversation on our LinkedIn group, Lawyers Coach. If there are any topics you'd like to hear us discuss, then just get in touch. <laughs>